I wrote a piece about the topic for today uh, not too long ago because it just happens this year uh, to be the uh, 80th anniversary of the publication of uh, Schumpeter's famous book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. It appeared in the midst of the Second World War uh, in 1942. It obviously at one level represents the climate of the circumstances of that time, but at the same time, Schumpeter felt that he was saying things that was interpreted for understanding not just the present, but what he feared were the trends and the directions of the future. Uh, the underlying premise uh, and part of Schumpeter's argument that I want to sort of draw upon here uh, is in this quote that I have here on the, the opening slide. Can capitalism survive? No, I do not think it can. Capitalism stands its trial before judges who have the sentence of death in their pockets. They're going to pass it, whatever the defense they may hear. The only thing a successful defense can possibly produce is a change in the indictment. So in other words, those who, who are going to judge capitalism and through their judgment influence the direction of government policy already have decided capitalism has to go. The defenders of capitalism can only influence what charges capitalism will be accused of before it's sent to the guillotine. That sounds somewhat less than optimistic. I actually have given this talk uh, for the students here. So uh, I obviously had to assume that they knew very little about him. So some biographical stuff I'm just going to quickly go over because I assume you may know more. But he was born in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, in a part of the, that is uh, in an area that is now part of the Czech Republic. He earned his uh, doctoral degree from the University of Vienna, uh, studying uh, among, uh, along with other professors, among some of the leading Austrian economists of the first generation. Uh, he studied with Eugen von Bumbavirk. He studied with Friedrich von Wieser. In uh, Bumbavirk's uh, seminar at the university, one of his co-students was Ludwig von Mises. Um, they were never close friends. Uh, he taught at several uh, Austrian universities and uh, has a, a checkered past in that. He, he taught at one in the far reaches of the eastern end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, what, what is now Western Ukraine. And uh, he, he was known for living a life of debauchery. Uh, he was doing a lot of writing at, 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 during the day and lecturing, but at night, he was a wild and crazy guy going to the, to, to, to the somewhat uh, uh, scandalous nightclubs and dens of iniquity, as they would say in English. I'm shocked. I'm terribly shocked. Uh, he, he ended up also then, uh, because of his writings and recognition, he, he taught at the University of Graz, closer to the, the Austrian center. Uh, shortly after the uh, end of the uh, First World War, uh, he was appointed briefly as the Minister of Finance in the new uh, Republic of Austria. Uh, he only held that position for less than a year. He then, shortly after that, became the head of a, of a bank, a private bank in Vienna, that during the hyperinflation, because Austria had a hyperinflation like neighboring Germany, uh, that went bankrupt. And uh, one story is, is that uh, the creditors of the bank were so upset about its bankruptcy and uh, blamed him that he supposedly had to sneak out of Vienna in the dead of night so his creditors could not take action against him. He shortly after that took up a teaching position at the University of Bonn in Germany, uh, where he taught until around 1932, uh, shortly before Hitler came to power in Germany, because he was offered a position at Harvard University in Boston. And he, he accepted that position, and he taught there until his death in 1950, uh, a relatively young man in his mid-60s. Uh, mid I also, for the students, I had a list of, of his works. The major ones are his theory of economic development. That's his major claim to fame, in the sense that's where he developed his theory of the entrepreneur. Uh, then his, his famous two-volume work on business cycles, which appeared in 1939. He hoped it would be the counterweight against the new Keynesian revolution that was occurring through Keynes's general theory book, which had come out in 1936. It was actually 
ignored by most of the profession. It was a failure in terms of the profession. Then he wrote the book that I'm focusing on for our purposes, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy in 1942. And then at the time of his death in 1950, he'd been working on a, on, on a major work that in print is well over 1,000 pages, A History of Economic Analysis. He had left it slightly unfinished, uh, sort of unfinished or, 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 or rough drafts. And his wife, Elizabeth Schumpeter, with the assistance of Gottfried Hobbler and others, worked up the last chapters into a publishable form. And it came, the book came out in 1954. It's considered a, a major classic in the, in the history of ideas now. OK. So uh, for Schumpeter, of course, the, the center of his system is the idea of the art as the creative and innovative transformer of production. He's the disruptor of what is, and he brings about something dramatically new that influences the society and the way economic things are done. Uh, in, in, his, in this book where he first presents this in, in a very clear fashion, his theory of economic development, what does the entrepreneur do? He introduces new goods or a new quality of a good that had not been there before. He introduces a new method of production that brings about cost efficiencies to lower expenses uh, that had not been tried or developed before. He opens new markets uh, to satisfy demands that had not been touched by the market. Uh, he, a conquest, as he puts it, of new sources of resources, raw materials, or, or half-manufactured goods that uh, increases the supply side of being able to produce more. And then, of course, uh, industrial organization, that is, carrying out a new organizational form of the industry that introduces innovations, productivity, cost efficiencies. And uh, it, e it either first creates a monopoly position or the, or the innovative transfer transformation helps undermine an existing monopoly. In Schumpeter's mind, over the last 200 years of capitalism, it's been these, the, 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 these men of, of, of great innovative ideas uh, who have been the, the, the molders and the makers and the shapers of all the good things that we experience in market society. The new products, the better products, the less expensive products, uh, the better ways of doing things in terms of uh, resource use or organization of the firms and enterprises, and so on and so forth. In fact, we would not have the dynamism of the market that we have if not for the entrepreneur. And that, of course, becomes the basis of his, of his famous restatement of this in the capitalism, socialism, democracy, his famous phrase, the, the perennial gale of creative destruction. In dealing with capitalism, we are dealing with an evolutionary process that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. The fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion always comes from the new consumer goods, the new methods of production and transportation, the new markets, the new forms of industrial organization that capitalist enterprise creates. In capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, that is the perfect competition model and the monopoly model, the type of competition which counts is the competition, again, of the new commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization, the competition that commands a decisive cost and quality advantage. It is hardly necessary to point out that competition of this kind we now have in mind acts not only when it is being, when it is in being, but also when it is merely an ever-present threat. It disciplines before it attacks. The businessman feels himself to be in a competitive position or situation, even if he is alone in the field. And, and for Schumpeter, this is why you need to look at capitalism not as like those diagram pictures in the economics textbook. Well, this is the perfect competition situation. This is the monopoly situation. Those are frozen frames of a motion picture. And you cannot understand the nature of the, of the dynamism of capitalism unless you watch, watch the whole film. Again, the way I express it to my students is that imagine if you're shown a frozen frame of a motion picture, and this frozen frame has, a, a, has someone hanging in midair off the edge of a cliff. Is this good or bad? Well, normally we'd say, wait, he's hanging in midair. Gravity's going to pull him maybe to his death. But what went before that put him in that situation? We could imagine at least two scenarios. He was being chased to the edge of a cliff, and he's been pushed off by the murderers because they want him to die crushed on rocks below. 
But could we not also imagine that the, that the murderers were chasing him to the edge of the cliff, and he knows that his fate is sealed, but he looks down and he sees, admittedly, far below a river. He isn't sure how deep it is. He knows if he stays on the edge of the cliff, they're going to kill him. It's possible if he jumps off and the river is deep enough, he can survive the fall, and the current will take him downstream and to safety. So how do we know what this frame is telling us, unless what we know what before and after? That's the sense in which I understand Schumpeter saying that you have to judge capitalism, as he says it, not at a moment in time, those frozen diagrams in our textbooks, but as a dynamic process in time looking over years or even decades. That is the basis upon which capitalism and its successes needs to be evaluated and judged. So if all of the, and, and you see, he believes that, that the freeing of markets with the end of mercantilism and the beginning of the introduction of liberal reforms in, in the early and mid decades of the 19th century, first in Britain and then in the United States and then a growing number of the Euro, on the European continent, is what has transformed the world. And then again, th these are two quotes. Uh, the first is from a series of lectures that he gave in Boston uh, the year before the book came out, because it's really, in my opinion, a concise way he explains his vision of what that laissez-faire was like and more or less existed. Before 1914, under capitalism, the world rapidly, uh, was rapidly inter internationalizing itself. Free movement of commodities, restricted if, if at all only by customs tariffs. Freedom, unquestioned in principle, of migration of people and of capital. All this facilitated by unrestricted gold currencies and protected by a growing body of international law that on principle disapproved of force or compulsion of any kind. At home, practically all civilized countries professed allegiance to the democratic ideal. The freedom of the individual to say, think, and do what he pleased was also within very wide limits generally accepted. This freedom included the freedom of economic action, private property and inheritance, free initiative, and conduct were essential elements of that capitalist civilization. And then reinforcing this, in 1946, he wrote the article on capitalism for a new edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And this is, this is a passage from that Encyclopedia Britannica article. The familiar features of capitalism and its political complement, liberalism, were, la were laissez-faire, in particular free trade and sound money, meaning unrestricted gold currency. A pacific, though far from pacifist, attitude towards foreign nations. In other words, international peace, not war. Unprecedented respect for personal freedom, not only in economic, but in all matters. The principle of leaving individuals to themselves and of trusting their free interaction to produce socially desirable results. That's the capitalism he has in mind. That never perfect, never pure, never the, the, the pristine ideal, but more or less a very wide, almost laissez-faire capitalism that compared to what was before and certainly after, more or less existed in that period of he considered between, let us say, 18, the, the early 1870s until the First World War. All of this is true. It gave us prosperity, rising standards of living, growing population that are living better and, 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 and materially at levels of comfort unmanaged, uh, unma unimaginable in the past. What went wrong? What are the forces against this? And uh, Schumpeter re re argues there's two arguments uh, or factors at work. He's concerned about the growth of corporate enterprises in the market economy. See, his image is of the individual entrepreneur, the man alone, who has the idea, the drive, the risk-taking spirit, who, who invests either his own savings or the borrowed savings of others he's persuaded to partner with him. He, he designs, he invests, he oversees, he directs, he markets, he innovates, he changes. The way I explain it to the students, the Steve Jobs is of the world, okay? You know, I, I tell the students, we take this for granted. This is only 15 years, less than 15 years old. It's hard to believe. It's only less than 15 years, the, the, the Steve Jobs iPhone smartphone. But he had this vision, and he told his, his technical experts, I want you to make something that will fit in my hand. 
And I want you to design it that the thumb could touch any of the buttons on the surface. And I want it to be not only a phone, but to text message, email, music, documents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In one sense, the Steve Jobs is the imagery of what Schumpeter had in mind of the entrepreneur. Because certainly this has transformed how we think about and what we do. We can't even imagine, this is our life. And there was a life. I, I also like to tell the students, this has ruined my life. I'm old enough to remember before any of these phone, mobile phones. When if you, if you wanted to, it was like the old fashioned you know, landline phones. Your wife says to you, why didn't you call? Well, dear, I, I couldn't find a pay phone, you know, on the street. Yeah, sure. Now she, I can't, why didn't you call? You have your phone with you. And worse, like, like the government, she can track every move I make. I can't escape. She's like the, she, she's like, she's like the CIA, the KGB. She's watching every move I make. It, it's scary. <laughs> Steve Jobs has done this to me. The good and the bad. Okay. <laughs> okay. He was concerned that the corporate structure would result in the submerging and the loss of that autonomous ability to act of the free entrepreneur in the, in, in, in the bureaucracy of the corporate structure. He also was concerned that this, this bureaucratization of, of corporate decision making could easily end up going hand in hand with government bureaucracy to end up in a loss of the dynamism and the competitiveness in the marketplace of what today we call these government business partnerships, sometimes referred to as crony capitalism, right? But I think that he, he was right about that because that goes on a lot, but the Steve Jobses have still been able to survive in spite of that in the post-World War II period. It's serious and it's a fundamental handicap and a corrupting element in, in the market economy, but the Steve Jobses are now the Musks who want to buy Twitter and everything or send spaceships out to other worlds, uh, still have the, the degrees of ability to act. The more fundamental one, and I think it was the one that he was more deeply concerned about, was his second factor. And that's the, 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 the rise and domination in capitalist society of an anti-capitalist intellectual class. These are the second-hander of ideas. You know, we're all in the division of labor. We're teachers, we're businessmen, we're workers in a factory, we have family, we have friends, we have home obligations. Our lives are filled with everything. How do we know what's going on in the world? What we should think about these things? We rely upon those in the division of labor who, in the broadest sense, are the intellectuals. They write the books, they write the magazine articles, they, they now do the blogging and, and, and the social media. And most of what's going on in the world, we hear from them uh, and implicitly their interpretations of what we should consider good, bad, right, wrong, supportive, or to be criticized, uh, because we depend upon them. Schumpeter believed that there's inherently an anti-capitalist bias in this. Why? The best summary I can give to his argument would be under sort of the following. The intellectuals hate capitalism because they don't believe that they get the recognition they deserve. What does that mean? <clears throat> They've gone to college. They've majored in so psychology, sociology, literature, women's studies, uh, gender studies. They've studied political science, even economics. And they go out in the world and well, you know, what's the job description if you've majored in gender studies or sociology, right? You know, sociology of, 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 of you know, primitive societies. You're often unable to get a job that you think would be appropriate for, for, for the knowledge of the big, the great, the important, the insightful, the profound, just, truth, meaning. And you have to take a job in a factory or writing advertising t uh, transcripts, uh, you know, to, to sell a product, you know, or if you, you, you went to the Juilliard School of Music, you were going to be the concert pianist, you're writing song jingles for a television commercial. <laughs> I'm writing the great novel. 
I'm going to be, you know, the next Edgar Allan Poe, the next Herman Melville, the next William Shakespeare. And I'm writing, you know, memos for a businessman, smoothing out his editing his memos. So there's very, they're resentful of this. The businessman, what does he do? Ah, he invents a clicker. Nice, but in the big stream, what's a clicker? He's made millions. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the artist. I'm, I'm the new, I'm, I'm the, you know, the frontier artist. My, my art should be, should be in the museums. I should be making millions, but everyone's like, oh, what? You know, the new Picasso. Instead, you know, what? I'm doing nothing. I, I have to, I have to make a living making pictures of those little animals with the big tears that tourists like to buy. Oh, nobody will buy my Picasso great painting. So th they resent all this. And it's capitalism that makes a millionaire out of some guy who's never gone to college and has made a clicker. And I've studied philosophy. I know the good, the beautiful, the just, the right. So there's a great resentment. Then added to that resentment, they look at the world. Look, the clicker guy is living in a mansion. The poor, what's his, he has too much, he has too little. And then finally, if only I was in charge. Because I know about the big things. I see how the world should be. I studied it, I've thought about it. So I should be the social engineer, the political paternalist, the planner and I'll make that better and beautiful world than I know people would want if only they had the knowledge and wisdom and caring and, and sense of right that I and people like me have. That, in my opinion, is the psychology of these people. And that's what Champagne is referring to. And again, this, this is in his own words. The man who has gone through college or university easily enters the intellectual class in a thoroughly discontented frame of mind. Discontent breeds resentment. I remember I would be in the English classes when I was an undergraduate. The, 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 my English professor constantly used one word, bourgeois. Bourgeois was like, like a, key, a key word. Whatever she disliked was bourgeois. That meant capitalist, middle class, low, low taste, you know, bourgeois. And so that person has gotten an English degree, gone out in the world, and they look around. Everything is bourgeois. Well, that's bad. So that breeds resentment on the consent discontent, and often rationalize itself in the social criticism, which is the intellectual spectator's typical attitude towards men, classes, and institutions. The role of the intellectual group consists primarily in stimulating, energizing, verbalizing, and organizing this material of anti-capitalist sentiments and resentments. The intellectual group cannot help nibbling away at the foundations of capitalist society because it lives on criticism. And its whole position depends on criticism that stings. And this hostility increases instead of diminishing with every achievement of capitalist evolution. That's the perverse paradox. The more capitalism it produces of wealth, opportunity, improvement, the more bitter and angry this intellectual class becomes. Intellectuals rarely enter into professional politics and still more rarely conquer responsible office. But they staff political bureaus write party pamphlets and speeches, act as secretaries and advisors, give the individual politicians newspaper reputation, which, though it is not everything, few men can afford to neglect. In doing these things, they to some extent impress their mentality on almost everything that is being done in society. So then the thing is, but wait a minute. The average person, they're enjoying all these better products, these innovations, this ease and comforts of life, uh, and in spite of the rhetoric, the, the diminishment of inequality. Compare a, a, a serf or a peasant 200 years ago compared to a member of the aristocracy then in 1820. The difference was like that. What's the difference between you, me, and, and Bill Gates or Steve Jobs in his life? He had a nicer house and he had a private jet. Guess what? I have a car. I have three flat screen TVs in my house. I have a bunch of uh, kitchen appliance gimmicks that my wife says is essential to her life. Bad, bad, bad attitude. And, oh, that hurt. 
anyway, uh, I go out to nice restaurants. If I want to, and if I want to spend my money in that way, I can buy a first-class ticket and fly to Europe. I don't even have to go to coach. Or I can even fly coach and go to the same three or four or five-star hotel as him if I'm willing to make the allocation of my budget and do some savings as he. The differences between us that they're constantly bemoaning about is like this compared to that 200 years ago. We are an increasingly in, in that material quality and ease of life, an egalitarian society. And they keep, and the more egalitarian in the sense of all of us have the same varieties and opportunities of, of ease of living, the more angry they become by the remaining degree of these differences. So why doesn't the common man who's the enjoying all this see this? And the problem is, Schumpeter believes, is that the defense of capitalism requires appreciating and understanding the long run view of things, those over years and decades, not the ups and downs of the moment. The case for capitalism, he says, can never be made simple. People at large would have to be possessed of an insight and a power of analysis, which is altogether behind, beyond them. Even if this is disregarded, rational recognition of the economic performance of capitalism and the hopes it holds out for the future would require an almost impossible moral feat by the have not. That performance stands out only if we take a long-run view. Any pro-capitalist argument must rest on long-run consideration. In order to identify himself with the capitalist system, the unemployed of today would have to be completely, would have to completely forget his personal fate, and the politician of today, his personal ambition. For the masses, it is a short-run view that counts. Like Louis XV, they feel après nous déluge, after us the flood. Secular improvements that is t improvement that is taken for granted and coupled with individual insecurity is acutely resented, is of course the best recipe for breeding social unrest. So he feels that the ordinary person takes all this for granted, but is upset by the discomforts and the inconveniences and the short run hardships that changing circumstances might create and cannot look beyond his own circumstances to, to, to the coherence, the coordinative, creative value of the system taking the longer view. So short run dominates long run. Or basically he's saying what Frederick Bastiat said, what is seen and what is not seen. I see my current problems, but I don't see the fact that the market has the ability to adapt and adjust and re-coordinate things, including my adaptation to the change circumstances that will in fact my, make me better off if I just look beyond a bit the here and now. So how right was he? Now, re remember the context in which he's writing. It's 1942. His immediate world was the experiences of the 1930s, the trauma of the Great Depression, the growth of the idea of activist government in the West, uh, the, the, the Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in America, which, by the way, he hated. He alienated himself, if you read the biographies, from a lot of his Harvard colleague friends because he was constantly criticizing Roosevelt and his policies. What do you mean you're criticizing Roosevelt? He saved America. Well, he didn't think so. Uh, and then came the war. And whatever remained of market activity ca came under central planning, not just in Soviet Russia, not just in Hitler's Germany, but in Britain, for, in the United States. The World War II resulted in command economies in the name of the war effort. And that's the world he sees in 1942. And th there's the ideology and the euphoria of if we have planning during war, surely we can continue our planning after the war, planning for peace. And in that setting, he, he felt despondent about this. Well, was he right? And my answer is, and I mean this absolutely positively, yes and no. <laughs> you know, is it an old story that President Harry Truman uh, introduced the first Council of Economic Advisors to the White House. And after his first meeting with them, he came out and the media was there, you know, the press was there to, well, Mr. President, how was your first meeting with your Council of Economic Advisors? His response was, I want a one-handed economist. What do you mean, Mr. President? I asked them questions, I kept saying, well, on the one hand, but on the other hand, I want a one-handed economist. <laughs> So, yes, he was both right and wrong. What do I mean by that? First, he, he says in the book 
that if, 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 if capitalism is left sufficiently free, looking over the next 50 or 60 years, it will be as transformative as bringing about positive change as it had been over the last 150 years. But he was doubtful whether it would have that freedom. The fact is, in spite of the growth of regulation, intervention, welfare, uh, redistribution, and so on, the core institutions of the market have been left sufficiently in place. Degrees of private property respected, degrees of competition, degrees of a person like Steve Jobs or Musk to be able to do what they're doing, uh, de degrees of freedom of exchange, even with minimum wage laws and various price controls here and there, like rent control. The market has still been able to function amazingly, even with these with being like Gulliver, tied down with all these little strings by the little putians of the government planners and bureaucrats, uh, along, with, along with those businessmen who are the crony capitalists who want to limit their competitors. In spite of that, our standard of living is amazingly higher than, than what, 70-odd years ago, with, with the 75 years ago with the end of the Second World War. It is a growing problem because our... Our institutional problem is, is the government, the interventionist welfare state, and crony capitalism. And that gets worse each year. But so far, the market, to the extent it has been able to function, has functioned amazingly effectively, wearing a tightly woven straitjacket, preventing total free movement of its activities. But it remains an effect even stronger than when he was writing, I would say is the anti-capitalist intellectual. Now, they don't make the case anymore, oh, the old Marxist case, oh, class conflict, the evil capitalist oppressing you know, the workers, the, the, the owners versus the proletariat. That doesn't carry any weight. Why? Because one of the achievements of the post-war period is the immense growth of a middle class. Now, the growth of middle classes may be of different degrees and size in different parts of the world, the post-war period sees the amazing continuing growth of the middle class. You have this balloon bulge of the middle class and some very wealthy and a growing number of less poor. I've, I've mentioned to the students, again, and I'll reiterate that here because it's a, I consider it a dramatic fact, taking the Schumpeterian long view. 200 years ago, in 1820, the world population was 1 billion, and economic historians and demographers estimate that out of that 1 billion, 90% lived in poverty. Today, the demographers and the economic historians used by the United Nations for their reports estimate that the world population today is 7.7 .7 billion people, almost eight times as large as 200 years ago. How many live in poverty? Well, before COVID struck, obviously. In 2019, less than 9% of that world, lar larger world population lived in poverty. So population has exploded, but the productive capacity of markets have grown so much that it is eradicate almost all poverty. And again, as I've told the students here, if, if the market is allowed to work at least a, a certain degree of effectiveness, a dream, the, a dream will be achieved that has been only a fantasy since all of mankind's recorded history. The end of poverty in their lifetime. This trend suggests that if the market is allowed to function, in their lifetime or their children's lifetime, when this century ends, poverty in that way it's usually measured will be gone. Will there be some more comfortable, less comfortable? Richer and less rich, certainly. But the idea of the person, like you see those international charity organizations, you know, the starving little African kid and you know, the, the, you know, you know, sewerage in the street, that's gonna be gone. I know it seems impossible, but if that if that trends, if the market is left alone, that'll be gone, or certainly near to be gone. That's the dream of humanity for all of recorded history. So in that sense, his his concern that capitalism was going to be destroyed and that type of prosperity would would no longer be possible has not occurred because the market has not been completely undermined. But it's 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 the second part, and that is the intellectuals hate for capitalism. This idea that it intensifies, the better the circumstances become. 
It's no longer class conflict because capital is making us so much more prosperous. We no longer view ourselves as the working class. So now they take the same contrast of, of conflicts among groups, but they change them. And again, I, 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 I summarize this. Political correctness. This is a totalitarian ideology of permitted words and actions. Oh, you can't use certain pronouns. Oh, you, you, you can't say, you know, a pregnant woman, the birthing person, because a man could view himself as a woman. You're discriminating, yes, you're, you're discriminating against the man who views himself as a woman if you say the female pregnant person. No, the birthing person. Yeah. Orwellian in this language use. And it's not only that, but your actions. Who can you interact with? What ways can you interact with? You know, what, what is a violation by, by your mere body language to be interfringing on someone's safe space because they might not feel comfortable with, 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 their, with the attitude they're reading from your persona? I have no idea how much this is per, pervading Guatemalan society yet, but in America it, it, and grow, increasingly in Europe, this, this, is, this is the new totalitarianism of word and deed. Identity politics. It's no longer classes. It's race and gender. Again, I don't know the dynamics here, but in America, are you white? Are you black? Are you Hispanic? Are you Asian? Are you male? Are you female? Are you gay? Are you straight? Are you one of the 24 in-between genders? I've also said to the students here uh, when this has come up, you know, the human race has existed on this planet for what? 200,000 years, 300,000 years, whatever the anthropologists say. It's been a long time. Amazing. For all of these hundreds of thousands of years, we incorrectly thought there were boys and girls. We had no idea. There were all these permutations in between. Thank goodness in the last 10 years, we have been freed from this ignorance of 300,000 years. I mean, give me a break. Give me a break. What type of madness is this? You know, George Orwell once said, some ideas are so absurd that it would only be believed by an intellectual. Some ideas are so absurd, it would only be believed by an intellectual. Uh, uh, uh. I, 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 I was talking to, to, to the, the dean of the business school at the Citadel one day. We were both standing outside the men's room, you know, nature calls, and it was occupied. And I asked him, if I have a transgender moment for 10 minutes, can I use the ladies' room? <laughs> since the men's room was occupied. I was told them that probably wouldn't work. But I said, but I feel my feminine side today. I, I don't know, but anyway, that wasn't gonna work. And, but, but this is very dangerous. You are no longer you. You no longer define who you are as a human being. What gives meaning, definition, value, purpose to you as an individual? You now are a gender or a race, and how you are categorized that way by those in political power, determine your fate, life fate as an individual. This is what this group deserves. This is what that group deserves. This is their station in life, the, their level of income. Your future is dictated by how others have classified you by these categories. It is a new tribal collectivism that is as dangerous and as repugnant, in my view, as Nazi ideology of master races and inferior races, and each must know their place or be eradicated. Cancel culture. There's another form of this. Suppression of all opposing views and ideas by erasing them from history and current circumstances. Uh, again, I'm sure you know this in America, they've been pulling down statues. Anybody, person from the past, oh, he was a racist, he was a sexist, he was this, he was that. Even if he wasn't a sexist and a racist, he sort of had an attitude that could be interpreted now as racist and sexist, so tear him down. But it's not just people of the past. Oh, he said something 35 years ago. Fire him. Ruin his career. Destroy his reputation. You know what the analogy of that is? In Stalin's Soviet Union with the purges. So you'd see a picture of Stalin and some guy, part of the, his inner circle. But he's purged him. He's been killed. He's been sent to a labor camp. And now a new edition of a book comes out 
and the picture's there, but that person has been airbrushed out. It's just Stalin, but that guy's there not anymore. It's like he's been erased. He's a non-person, to use Orwell's phrase. He's gone. It's as if he never existed. This is what cancel culture wants to do to the past. They're going to erase what they don't want and rewrite the past and the present to fit their script, which is a carbon copy of Orwell's 1984. If you've read the book, who's the anti-hero in the book? Winston. What does Winston do for a living? He works in the Ministry of Truth. What is the job of the, in the Ministry of Truth? He, he reads what is the, the totalitarian government's party line today. And then he goes back in the archives and rewrites the old newspapers so the past reflects the party positions of today. In other words, the party can never be wrong. Whatever the party said in the past is rewritten so it fits today. This is what these people are trying to do. The Green New Deal. The Green New Deal. Oh, the world is ending in 12 years because of climate change. Okay. Warming of the earth. First of all, I find this a little weird because we've been having a 12 year horizon for 25 years. It's like the, 20, the 12 years is like a moving 12 years. If we, if we believed them, we would have burned up as a crisp about 20 years ago. But separate from that, even if these warming cycles are occurring, it may just be the natural cycles of the, world, of the earth. There have been, there have been uh, uh, ice ages. There have been warming periods. That's just the movement of the planet itself. It might very well have a human component to it, either greater or smaller. I don't claim to be a physicist or a scientist to make that judgment. But even if it is, from one cause or another, how do you adjust and adapt to this without imposing cost beyond what would seem reasonable? You turn to the market. What are the market opportunities? What are the cost-efficient ways to respond to this? How might things be done differently in changing availabilities of resources and, 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 and changing climates that people need different things in different places? Allow the market to adapt and adjust at the margin to the changing circumstances as best to adapt. If it's getting worse, it stabilizes, it then gets better. But what is their solution? Again, I don't know how much this is down here, but they call it the Green New Deal in the United States. And they're calling, oh, this is a crisis. It's like a war. And in war, the normal arrangements of society cannot prevail. It's an emergency. And that requires top-down control. So at the national level and then the international organizations, there has to be global central planning. What will be produced? How it will be produced? Where it will be produced? How people will travel? What forms of transportation? Where they will work? What, where will their workspace be like? What kind of products can they buy? What should they eat? Oh, the cows give off foul things in the air. We all have to become vegetarians. And undoubtedly, some will say, by command. This is not an exaggeration. It sounds ludicrous if you just say it. But these people mean it. You read them, and they say it with a straight face. And if you read them, any, now, you know, any of their arguments, like in Mises and Hayek, the rationality of the market, the importance of price signals, uh, prices tell us in some objectified market sense, people's judgments of the opportunity cost of resources in alternative uses and applications that helps direct, you know, in cost efficient ways how we do things. These people don't talk about that at all. It's the technology says, the, the global uh, environmental problem dictates. It is, it is a planning with total economic irrationality. It, it's as if Mises and Hayek have literally been culture canceled. They've been erased. These people know nothing about these Austrian and general market type ideas and the nature of trade-offs, cost and benefits, marginal decision making, incentives and institutions. Just the central plan, because we know it needs to be done, and technologically this is what we've decided is how it should be arranged. And finally, what I call pandemic authoritarianism. This is what we experienced for the last two and a half years. Okay, suddenly the coronavirus shows up. And we all follow the Chinese model, the lockdown model. China has conquered the world. Xi Jinping is, is not just president of China, he's the global president. 
It was his his determination to shut down t tens of millions of people. And what have they done? What did they do in Europe, in the United States? I assume forms here. Stop producing. Don't go to work. Stay home. Only shop when we tell you, and for certain essentials that we define. And certainly, wear a mask and don't stand closer than a certain distance from another person. Otherwise, there will be consequence to be paid. And if you don't, you're threatening the world. And I'm, I'm, I was, I've been flabbergasted by the degree to which our fellow human beings have passively and obediently said, yes, yes, thank you, paternalistic government. Thank you, daddy politician. Th thank you. Yes, we must do this. Yes, I have to stay home. I can't talk, visit my sick relative. My, 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 my relative is dying in a hospital. I can't say goodbye to them. No, I can't earn a living. Yes, if my business is destroyed. The danger of this is the precedent it is set. Because the next time there's a health care crisis, as they define it, or some other emergency, well, you know, we had to do this last time. This is the model that we've decided works. And the passivity with which all of us, to one degree or another, have just obeyed the government in these matters. It's those things, this intellectual undermining and destruction and, 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 and disapproval and, and hatred of capitalism. These, these are the new indictments, you see, that are being presented for the same death sentence of capitalism. Now, I will say here, I don't want to sound despondent here, right? And Schumpeter wasn't. You know, when the book came out, everybody viewed him as defeatist, a pessimist. You know, the world is ending. There's nothing to be done. But the fact, he didn't want it to be interpreted that way. The book came out in a second edition in 1946. I should have made that 1946. I'm sorry, because it's from the introduction to the second edition. But he says, facts in themselves and inferences from them can never be defeatist or the opposite, whatever that might be. The report that a given ship is sinking is not defeatist. Only the spirit in which this report is received can be defeatist. The crew can sit down and drink, but it can also rush to the pumps. That is, they can rush to the pumps, try to keep the ship afloat, make repairs, and maybe make it better and sturdier than it was before the damage. If men merely deny the report, though it is carefully substantiated, then they are escapists. What normal man will refuse to defend his life merely because he is quite convinced that sooner or later he will have to die anyway? Frank presentation of ominous facts was never more necessary than it is today because we seem to have developed escapism into a system of thought. So he considered himself merely the warner of how he's interpreting the trends. He's saying what happens next is not inevitable. Do you sit down and drink as the ship sinks? Or do you man the pumps and do the repairs to try to keep it afloat and make it better than it was before? So do you give in and let capitalism die? Or do you, um, or do you fight to keep it and restore it and improve it and free it from the impediments it's been having? OK, and I've ended it with a pep talk for your students. I've said, which is it to be? You have the opportunity to be at an institution like Francisco Marroquin that offers not only a world-class education, and I reiterate that, reiterate that to them, by any benchmark standards, a world-class education, which is increasingly recognized, but in a setting philosophically, political, ideologically, of the foundations and the principles and the importance of liberalism and the market economy that they are the next generation to keep the ship afloat and to restore it to resist threats in the future. And that's what this place is about. That is the message, not of defeat, but they're the next generation of intellectuals to replace these. I, I, if I didn't believe it was possible, I wouldn't spend my life teaching students, writing the things I do, books, articles, giving public talks. The future is not given. You know, Ludwig von Mises wrote an essay in the early 1950s called Trends Can Change. And he says in this, 
time after time, people have looked at their circumstances and seen a trend that seems to be going on. It's inevitable, it's inescapable, it's not, it's not reversible. But when you take the longer view, very often those trends have changed from, from, from where people thought they were moving. And as he said, trends, trends can change again. But only if people have the courage and the willingness to fight to stop it and move the society in that better liberal direction. Thank you very much.